Hello everybody, welcome to Derek's five o'clock uh, chat show. Today, uh, yet again, I have the uh, commentator and financial guru with us, uh, Justin Urquhart-Stewart. I'm absolutely t delighted to invite Justin for the third time to appear on the show and I'm particularly interested and I know the viewers are particularly interested in what's going on in the financial markets. It's two months since we've seen you Justin. Thanks again for uh, joining us and we've got a number of questions that we'd like to ask you. But first of all we have uh, some finance people on here, finance experts, but we also have some people who just want to leave their money in a safe place and trust the system and have a pension at the end of it. And they've been reading about uh, Neil Woodford and uh, all sorts of strange things that have been going on. Would you just give us a run through um, on the basics and why, you know, you can lose 25% in a secure fund like that, that you would trust? And Hargreaves Lansdowne have been recommending it for years. Hmm. And make an extra charge as well for doing so. Um, and, the, and the answer, it all comes down to the the original problem is that no one has ever educated any of us about finance, whether it's in terms of personal finance, how much money do we need to have in our family in order to retire. By the time we've actually worked it out, we've normally retired, uh, which is a bit late. Um, and it should be not just part of the curriculum, it should actually be part of a, a standard uh, structure whereby people should be leaving school with a much, much more practical, better understanding of not only what they've got to try and save, how much, and the sort of returns. Now, all of that can change, and in the past year, we've seen a huge change. So all the calculations you could have made, say, five or six years ago as to what your sort of reasonable return would be, have now been halved, and halved again, and so your returns are going to look pretty thin. The result of which, the charges, some overt, some not so, uh, will seek to actually not only just erode, but actually sometimes just uh, destroy any returns that you've been getting. And also, actually then to understand, you know, there is very little which is risk-free. Cash isn't risk-free, as people will remember from the banking crisis and how banks can go bust. Cash is also is not risk-free because the rate of interest you're getting on it is actually lower uh, than the rate of inflation. So it's devaluing. So it's very difficult situation where you try and find something which is a reliable. And there was always, by my first pupil master actually, at, uh, when I was doing it at bar school, but talking about finance, he always sort of said, rule number one of investing is don't lose the sodding stuff. Rule two, refer to rule one. Um, and it may sound stupid, but you'd be amazed at the number of firms I come across and portfolios I come across where they haven't actually just made money for people in the longer term. Um, and you don't have to be a star. You don't have to be, let's assume Neil Woodford two or three years ago, everyone loved him because he could do no wrong. The trouble is, if you looked inside, you would have actually been much more concerned. But no one wanted to do that. No one wanted to actually sit there and say, the emperor appears to be somewhat sartorially challenged. Um, in that particular case, I did actually challenge it and found myself facing a, a rather stroppy legal letter you know, threatening all sorts of things um, because fundamentally what he was doing wasn't illegal but was misleading uh, to anybody who really thought compared to, well, misleading compared to what people expected they were going to be getting out of this. Um, and he actually and his uh, fellow uh, colleague when they were at Invesco together, a chap called Barnett, um, and they ran that fund, their fund together. When he split away, they effectively ran two funds which were almost identical. And they were buying into uh, medium-sized stocks, which aren't very liquid, not easily tradable. And as they were buying into them, of course, uh, the price was going up because they said they were buying them and everyone could see that and they were effectively pushing the price up to the extent that they ended up controlling in quite a few occasions 40% of the entire stock, which meant effectively they were the company. It meant also that they couldn't sell it because if they started selling it, then they will automatically force the price down. So it was a ludicrous situation to be in. And then they had also, it was supposed to be an equity income fund providing with income. So some of the companies weren't even floated and weren't providing an income. 
um, for those in the UK may know the name of Purple Bricks, a sort of online estate agent, whether yep. it's any good sure. or not, remains yep. to be seen, but hasn't made any money yet and uh, certainly doesn't actually have any publicly quoted shares, but those who had Woodford and also Mr Barnett's fund as well would have found themselves with a, a happy little dose of that, achieving absolutely nothing for them. Anyway, okay, to answer um, your question, where do you go to? Yeah, the that's moment? the question. Well, this, it's reached the stage, and I've always been incredibly cynical over gold, on the basis that gold, you get, as soon as you mention gold, you get various people coming out of the woodwork called gold bugs, who will tell you that actually gold has been a fantastic return ever since Queen Cleopatra had trouble with an asp. Um, well, I don't know about you, but I wasn't around then, and uh, the asps are still there. Uh, but the point is this, gold doesn't give you any income. And you can sit and look at it, you can lick it if you like, that's about it, but put it on the pillow next to you and stroke it. Um, so it's really a matter of whether it goes up or down. So I've not been much of an advocate for it. However, we're now in the situation where equities are somewhat unreliable, to say the least, and we all know what's been happening with the economic reports and the corporate reports over the past few weeks. Nothing particularly surprising there. No, it's been bad news. Um, and then also uh, the bond market, where you've got then returns on the bond market looking very thin indeed. And you've got some government debt, which is negative. And you've got some government debt, take for instance Portuguese government debt, which is effectively cheaper than US. Are we really saying that Portuguese debt is better than the US? Well, of course we're not. So we find ourselves in a strange position. And that's why people then start turning to gold or maybe silver. Um, and whereas a few years ago, that was actually quite difficult to do unless you actually wanted to go out and buy a lump of it, unless you happen to find a sort of a, an old Nazi train on the bottom of a Swiss lake. Um, but now you could actually do so by buying an exchange traded fund um, uh, very simply, and you can buy the value of gold or silver, various other alternatives like that very easily indeed, so long as they are physically backed, actual, so that uh, what they'll be saying is you've bought your X ounces of gold and they actually exist in that little hole down the corner, that safe secure area, because you'll find other ones which are the equivalent of gold. Well, okay. so if anything does go wrong, there's not necessarily any gold at the end of that particular rainbow. Anyway, what it's a huge pop? question and that's barely a proper answer. I've always liked property, Justin, because I can control it. There's no intermediary and uh, I can go and touch it, touch the bricks. Now, is that, uh, is that good or bad? At the moment, it's going to be actually quite dangerous. Uh, first of all, we have to have this fixation. Um, certainly in Britain, there's this lovely line that uh, Britain has been a nation of uh, house owners. Well, actually, that's not been true. Uh, ever since Mrs. Thatcher was uh, selling off the, the counter houses and we had that housing boom, then we had a lot more people owning houses. Prior to that, you had a lot of people actually doing long-term rentals. And I mean long-term, talk about lifetime rentals. So people didn't actually have to fork out for the purchase of a, of a property. Uh, and of course in Britain, particularly obviously in London and South East, that's been a huge amount. Um, and over the years, you could have become a millionaire in South East by doing absolutely nothing at all having bought a property um, but it's it's going to be very difficult for the next generation if we brought back longer term leases you'd still be paying for the lease but you wouldn't have to have bear the mortgage of buying the property and therefore if you could actually use that money for other things to invest in giving you possibly greater flexibility but rule one of property if you're, it's your home it's your home you know, it's not something you're going to be buying and selling the entire time. You actually want to live there probably for some time. And obviously you want it to make money in the longer term. But buying and selling property itself is a bit of a gamble. We've had buy to let was a fashion for several years in this country. Hardly surprising because the tax breaks were stupendous. You could even offset the interest on it. It was brilliant. Anyway, all that's gone. There are all sorts of now extra taxes you pay for buy to let. And so therefore uh, that area has gone. Plus the fact. When you are letting property, most people who've done it for any period of time will tell you, you make money out of the capital value, not necessarily out of the rent itself. You may make a bit, but by the time you've deal, dealt with uh, some tiresome tenants, and I have to say, even when you think you've got a good tenant, they're not you, they don't love the house. They, as far as they're concerned, they will well, not say wreck it, but they won't treat it like their own. So be wary of property. Now, the other issue, and I was doing something actually the day before yesterday, 
uh, for Chinese television, that well-known British uh, outlet, um, about what's happening to UK commercial property. And they were focusing on what's actually happening in the city of London. And we all know, see pictures of the city of London, it looks like a ghost town at the moment. And because so many people are not being asked to go back to the office, uh, quite a lot of them, I know, for UBS, certainly at seven, they're being told, no, don't come back till after Christmas, which is astonishing. And in fact, quite a few of them are saying, actually, don't come back at all. And what we're going to be seeing is more of those, I think we just mentioned before, that rather rude acronym of people coming twats. Uh, my apologies. The twat actually stands for Tuesdays, Wednesdays and Thursdays. So people are actually spending a few days a week attending the office. Why? Because then you can still actually be able to garner and develop the team attitude, which is so important with, uh, with companies. I think it's important mm -hmm. to have got mm -hmm. management actually uh, properly being seen to run their people, which is very difficult, but just on Zoom. And also being able to have that mutter from the gutter that you need next to the water fountain and the canteen and things like that. So what they'll be doing is having groups coming into the office. Now, in the case of Seven, I know certainly with a lot of the uh, uh, big, in, big uh, investment institutions, they're going to take the opportunity at the next uh, rental break, and uh, normally your five years are sort of 10 years with a five-year break, um, actually to restructure, which is a euphemism for actually saying cut, it, cut back their property holding. In our case, that's probably going to be about over 50%. And that's a huge saving for them. Now, you take 50%, say 40, 30, doesn't really matter, off commercial property usage in the city of London and then also Canary Wharf, that's going to be a huge issue of open property. And you're going to see an awful lot of, you know, apparently designer flats suddenly appearing in what used to be offices. Okay. But also, um, look, but look at the retail side. Sorry, I'll, I'll shut up for a second. No. The retail side, you look at the shopping centre underneath Canary Wharf. That's quite a high-end shopping centre, shopping mall. And as well in the city, all the pret a mangers and things, they're dead as a dodo and they're not coming back. So uh, in terms of commercial property, that's very dangerous at the moment. Okay, I mean, that's what I was gonna ask you. Now, these property companies are highly geared, land securities, people like this. The um, retailers are highly geared. We've seen all these uh, restaurants going bust because they're highly geared uh, with private equity money or even um, emergency money or whatever the word yep. is. What's going to happen? That, wor that worries me. What's the outcome of that? They, they're going to go well, bust and then restructure? Well, remember, a lot of those, you're talking about some of those high street restaurants, a lot of those were going to go bust anyway. Because remember, we've sort of slightly forgotten this now because of the virus. We were heading for a slow down stroke recession. And a lot of those businesses were going to have difficulty. Remember, private equity, uh, they, they don't give you debt. They organize for you to have more debt and it's a three-year investment, they'll say it's five. That's only if they can't sell it in three. And so you get past the parcel, you get sold to another private equity firm who come along and say, I've got this cracking good idea. If we get some more debt for you, we could actually grow it again. And so that's what you have. So you end up with, um, you know, Jamie Italia um, or Carluccio's and the other ones, all of which were heading for the rocks anyway. Okay. And yeah. uh, actually they failed last year and you see more go this year. So. Watch out for those. And I was writing today about zombie companies. We've got to be very careful. It's an overly dramatic title. Zombies for me never got much beyond sort of Michael Jackson's, Michael Jackson's thriller video. But companies which should have died but can't because the banks or whoever's lending the money don't want to go through the final act of pulling the rug because they normally like to pull the rug not at the bottom of the market when things are starting to recover. Well, they aren't starting to recover at the moment. And also a lot of the banks don't want to actually uh, pull the rug because that means they're going to have to put aside money to cover that. And capital is at a premium, so they don't want to use it up. So these companies can't grow. They can't get more capital. And at the same time, they're not dead. Um, and these are the zombie companies. And we need to be very careful. You don't find yourself stuck in that particular position. And you're going to see, I'm afraid, more of those uh, coming through as uh, they run into financial problems. How's your uh, investment and your legacy uh, in regionally going? I see Funding Circle uh, uh, share price dropped by about 80% and uh, Amigo, I think that's another. Um, are these all similar or don't I quite understand what's happening? Can you? No, no they're very fun, funding, funding Circle, although Amigo, is, uh, there's nothing particularly original about that. That's just getting someone else 
uh, to actually guarantee your loan for you. Um, that's what you do with a bank and you drag your father or uncle on with you to actually sign it off and uh, act as your guarantor. So Amigo Loans uh, for now had a great advertising campaign and the loans aren't particularly cheap and they were aimed at a particular area of the market, made a lot of money and I think there's an awful lot of bad news going to come out of that of uh, mis-selling and such like. Um, things like, uh, you know, uh, you've got crowdfunding, uh, which is, I'm afraid, some disasters are going to come out there because it hasn't been properly regulated. It sounded good whilst the sun is shining. But when you start getting failures, life gets a bit more painful. Right. You know, what, I've, what I've done with regionally is, is not actually, I'm not giving people, investing people's money in this. What I've tried to do is put back some of the infrastructure so that regional companies can get more investment at the moment. If you are, say, investing money, you're with a, um, say, a local, uh, local authority pension fund, where does that money go? And the answer is it'll probably go to a perfectly good firm, maybe certain investment management or UBS or something like that. Um, and they'll give you a nice balanced portfolio spread over different asset classes all the way around the world, but not in your local town. So if you're in Newcastle, how much that money is going to go to Newcastle? The answer is none. So actually the system has been bent so that this infrastructure enable people to invest in regional businesses um, has meant that those businesses don't have access to capital. If you put that piping back, that means those businesses can be matched up with investors, not just in the region, but elsewhere as well. And if they need proper corporate advice. And you know, those corporate advisors are quite often the regional accountants and those ones to do the due diligence on it. And then you have a platform so these companies can be listed. It's not a stock exchange, but it's a means of being able to promote uh, the awareness of these different regions, those companies there, which people can invest in, getting companies to understand that they should design their shareholder base. Who do they want as shareholders? Because an awful lot of companies end up with, well, give us the money, I don't care who the shareholders are. Yes, you should. Is it for family? inheritance is it staff is it your suppliers going to have some your clients maybe or is it just long-term investors well more to point you probably don't want short-term investors um, and so actually getting companies to think about that giving access to more capital into the regions because who's going to do it it's not the bank's job they're only there to provide debt normally relatively short-term debt um, and so there are regional investment funds but they're still relatively small, and this is for growing businesses, between half a million and seven to 10 million, and then providing them on this platform the ability to trade those shares as a secondary issue, not as a primary issue, so that the company can then say once every three years, five years, or once a few months, enable people to actually buy or sell those shares, establish the price, and you do that simply with a matched order board, which is simply an order board. You put up the price at which you're selling and it matches with someone who actually wants to try and buy it. It's very cheap, easy to regulate and provides low cost capital for British growing businesses, which have found it always very difficult to get more capital. If you are starting up, there's lots of startup schemes. If you're a larger company, then there's lots of alternatives there. But if you're in that bit, between half a million and 10 million, it's really difficult to actually try and find that money and give you the opportunity then to actually get the right shareholders you want. This is going down extremely well, I'm pleased to say. Um, so it's not just a matter of giving people money, it's making sure that infrastructure is in place, connecting the investors to those companies in a properly regulated with uh, structure with proper due diligence. So hopefully that'll make, a, I think, a, a not huge difference, but a significant difference to quality British businesses in the regions. Fantastic, that's absolutely brilliant. Congratulations from all of us for what you're oh, doing pleasure. there. And uh, you. we wish you absolutely well. We've got Tim from Texas on, and you, you mentioned uh, China, and you wrote about China uh, in your newsletter. Oh. And by the way, how do people get hold of your newsletter? Do they, um, if they email me, um, I'll email you and you can... Um, well, by all means, I could very happily put them on, on, our, on our circulation. Equally, I think it's on your website. Um, and uh, equally, of course, it can come to the regionally website as well. But I'm delightfully, delighted to send uh, it directly to uh, any of your clients. I'm very happy to do so. Just forward the email address on and I'll be able to do that. Fantastic. Uh, and the idea is not to try and sell regionally. The idea is to try and provide something that's always important to me, to try and make investment information interesting 
you can't make it necessarily entertaining. That can be a bit flippant, but you can actually try and make it at least engaging for people and get away from some of the loose, useless technical jargon, which are frankly just uh, often just a uh, spurious armor that people put on because it makes them sound as though they know what they're talking about. And I do find that quite funny because in the past, I've actually made up certain apparent technical terms in the city um, and found that a few weeks later, people start using them. <laughs> and it's rubbish. Really? I have one, I have one which is called an armadillo. And uh, so was in one interview, I said, this is an armadillo stock. And uh, by which I actually meant it was a heavily scaled back new issue at the share price was scaled back. And lo and behold, three weeks later, some, some other pompous kid, probably like me, uh, came on and said, this is an armadillo. Do you think, well, if you could make it up, it just shows how shallow some of these things can be. Perhaps we should make something up on here and then see if we can get it into uh, circulation. The Financial, oh, Times, the Financial Times had a big article about the greenback and the dollar on, uh, on Saturday. Uh, dollars trading at one pound. 30 i was thinking about buying some and uh, seeing what happened with mr trump but uh, what is happening uh, with the dollar it all looks a bit it's, it is i mean the weakness of the dollar is is uh, quite a remarkable situation remember uh, we have reserve currencies in the world what's a reserve currency a currency which central banks use to keep reserves in very simply the largest one is of course the dollar the second largest one which is about 60 65 percent of all government reserves around the world the next one is the euro after that, you'll have the yen. Um, and uh, then also a very small amount is actually still sterling, which is still a reserve currency. The Chinese would say that yuan or nimbi is a reserve currency. No, it's not. It would like to be, but it's not properly tradable as yet. As uh, quite rightly, the Americans do highlight the fact that, of course, the Chinese have a habit of manipulating their currency, which is partially true. I have to say, find any country which doesn't actually try and influence its uh, uh, in the value of its uh, currency, it will always have that in the back of its mind. But the Chinese can actually do that very directly by putting controls on it. So what's happened with the dollar at the moment, there's been a lot of fear as to what's happening to the American economy. So people are actually pulling out of the dollar. But the question is, where are they going to go? Is Europe looking that much better? No, not really. And that's why people have been therefore now looking at gold. And looking at gold, look, not because it's actually going to provide an income, because it obviously doesn't. There's not much you can do with gold. You say you can lick it, you can stroke it, put it on the pillow next to you. Um, but you hope it's actually going to go up in value. But more to the point, hopefully hold its value. Um, and so for about, I think, only the second time in my, my investment career, I'm actually saying to people, actually buy some gold and have that there as a, that sort of level of security for the time being until we can actually start seeing the other side of what's happening with the virus and getting the recovery. Uh, starting to come through. And um, you were on Chinese television. You were quite brutal about the Chinese in your newsletter about two weeks ago. Did they pick yeah. that up and want to talk to you about it? Yes, yeah, so I said, if you don't see me in a few weeks' time, you know what's happened. Just check the concrete in the garden, see if um, it's been freshly laid. Um, I was actually just going through, because uh, they would often tell you actually how wonderful everything is with China. Well, actually, there are 17 active border disputes that the Chinese have with their neighbours. Um, and it's quite funny if you just go around some of those and actually see what's going on. Uh, you know, it's not just uh, old historical disputes dating back to Chinese emperors, there's some of those too, but the East China Sea where they're bickering with the Japanese, and that's very dangerous because that's two large powers butting up against each other. And remember, uh, the Chinese and the Japanese don't get on terribly well. The Japanese seem to be short of one particular word which they don't like using, which is sorry. Um, and the Japanese Prime Minister has an unfortunate habit of turning up at the uh, war shrine, which happens to include some of the, uh, the less than pleasant individuals who are convicted of war crimes, and he knows exactly what he's doing by going to that war shrine. He's tweaking the dragon's tail. This has got nothing to do with oil and gas. It's got something which is more important than the Far East, and certainly I know with my family, face, pride, who's going to back down? Then you've got the issue of the South China Sea, where the Chinese are currently arguing, it's quite clever to piss off this number of people. You've got Vietnam, you've got uh, Brunei, Indonesia, Philippines and Malaysia, because they claim just about all of the, of the South China Sea and the 200 mile extended economic zone, which puts it actually beyond Malaysia. 
Um, and you can see now with the Americans trying to force flights in the area, the Philippines as well. But of course, they're all frightened, the smaller countries are coming up against China because the action the Chinese can take in terms of your trade, to which I would cite Australia, where already Chinese action has uh, impacted on their trade because they threw out Huawei as, a, as an operator for 5G, uh, just as the United Kingdom has now done. So you've got that, you've got disputes in India as well, uh, over the Northeast, around Assam and Sikkim and Bhutan. Kashmir is an Indian-Pakistan problem, isn't it? Well, no, actually, because 30% of Kashmir was taken by the Chinese to direct translation, look after it. Then there are disputes with Kazakhstan, Tajikistan, and I feel very sorry for the Mongolians, who a few years ago, the Chinese announced that all Mongolians are, in fact, Chinese. And the Mongolians said, no, we're not. He said, well, if you're not Chinese, you're Russian. Oh, bugger. Um, doesn't give them much of a choice, really. Um, so anyway, that's, I suppose, slightly beside the point. China is asserting itself. And it's asserting itself after what they would say is the 100 years, 19, 1830 to 1940, so 110 years, of humiliation, where the Western powers and Japan were all nibbling away at concessions in China, which we'd probably call colonies, and we're most familiar to us as obviously Hong Kong. But the Germans, Austria-Hungarians, -Hungar the Belgians, the Americans, everybody had a bit. And take advantage. The British took it one stage further and decided that actually drug peddling was a good idea and we grew opium in India, and we ended up fighting two opium wars to ensure that the Chinese allowed us to trade opium into China. Somewhat embarrassing as a history. Anyway, so what you're now seeing in, with China, and you can see this particularly throughout Africa, and I was in Uganda last year, uh, in my old, one of my old hunting grounds, and you can see the amount of Chinese investment going in there, and what they have a habit of doing is coming with low-cost loans initially, and the cost goes up, the country whatever reason, then finds itself sometimes with corruption, sometimes not, can't service the debt, and the debt is then referred back to and is then taken over by another Chinese institution. Classic example of this was Sri Lanka, where the Chinese announced to the Sri Lankans, you need another port in southeast Sri Lanka. Well, I don't know if you've been to Sri Lanka, but southeast Sri Lanka is not a lot, except a couple of elephants wandering around. Um, but they built this port and arranged their finance. The Sri Lankans found that they couldn't pay for this, so actually the port was then taken over by the port of Shanghai, which is a, just a, a body of the Chinese government. And what is so strange is, of course, this port just happens to fit nearly all of the Chinese fleet in the Indian Ocean. And who does that upset? Well, the Indians, because the clue's in the name. It's the Indian Ocean, not the Chinese Ocean. Um, so you can see what's happening here. This is colonialization by another route. Uh, whether you approve it or not, that's not the issue. That's actually what's going on. The good side of it is they are seeing investment going to these areas. The bad side of it is the influence and uh, eventual ownership uh, will be transferring. So we need to be very careful of this. So uh, be wary of what you're being told. The trouble is you've got Trump at the moment trying to deal with the Chinese by trying to use a hammer. That's not how you negotiate with the Chinese. Uh, that maybe is how you negotiate with other people where you can wave your finger and shout at them. The Chinese, you do it quietly, round the back, and sort it out so no one loses face and you get the agreement. Everything that Trump has been talking about is not new. Uh, intellectual property disputes and things like that have already been discussed and some of it's already been addressed. In terms of manufacturing and unfair trade and things like that, well, actually, to a great extent, actually, that's benefited the US. Does the US really want to go back to low-cost manufacturing or lower-cost manufacturing? The answer is no, it doesn't. So I'm afraid it's somewhat simplistic arguments on Trump's part. Um, which has actually caused quite a lot of damage to, uh, Ameri to American industry and uh, to part of the economy. So China is a big issue. You can't ignore it. The world's second largest economy, and it is growing. Um, and so you have to handle it very carefully indeed. What you don't do is just write a load of tweets and insult everybody. That doesn't work. OK, we better turn some, to some good news now, Justin, before... Chris, um before we uh, wind up the recording and throw it open to everybody. So uh, you and I are very positive people. We believe in, uh, in, in, in the good news, uh, et cetera. So uh, what have you got for us? And um, will you make some forecasts for when I ask you back in at the beginning of October? We'd like a few <laughs> forecasts for you. Just okay, we mentioned off. some of this before and you can see what's happening. Two uh, obvious things. One is the impact of technology. 
um, and how that's changing. So businesses are fundamentally changing the way that they're operating. So banks and others. And uh, so you can make use of that as an opportunity in terms of not, I don't mean just the fang companies, the, you know, the Facebooks and the Googles and all of those ones. With that, we know that story. It's the next generation of technology, uh, which will be interesting there. Look at those businesses coming through. And, you know, that'll take some investigation to try and look at those and see which ones are really cutting it through and find a, a little area they can actually prosper from. That's one area, the technology. The other area of that is then localization. Companies are looking to reduce their supply lines. That does not mean that Apple's going to move its production from, I, from, you know, from China, from iPhones to Isleworth. Uh, but it does mean that actually other companies will be saying, I don't need to run the risk of long supply chains, uh, particularly if there's going to be another outbreak of, uh, of the virus or something else. I want to de-risk my business, so I want local suppliers. And again, the opportunity there, I think, will be very interesting. Now, one third area, then I'll shut up, is also the issue of things which are green and environmental issues. Two, three years ago, no one really wanted to know. We were all aware of it. And people would often say, I want a portfolio. Oh, and by the way, can I have a, an environmental bit as well? Almost a bit of an excuse to say, well, I've done my bit and I bought some unleaded petrol. Now that's changed. Now you actually get people saying, actually, I want to make sure everything I'm doing is working to help and make sure it is uh, positive towards the, uh, to, towards, uh, the, uh, the globe and in terms of the climate and such like. So fundamentally change. So take oil companies a moment. If you're an oil company and you do not have a very clear proposition as to how you're gonna manage uh, oil and alternative fuels over the next few years, then you will actually find yourself being thoroughly spanked for it. One of the reasons that Aramco, the Saudi Arabian oil, natural oil company is being floated is quite rightly they realize they've got an asset which in a hundred years will be worth close to zero likely. So get the money for it now. BP were laughed at five years ago when they changed their, uh, their sort of brand name from British Petroleum to actually Beyond Petroleum. And everyone laughed at them and they dropped it. But in reality, that's exactly what they're doing. And we can now see that actually uh, that uh, environmental energy production has moved from the sidelines into being really very significant indeed. And also from being marginal also being uh, for having a cost actually now providing also something which is profitable and there's a lot more to be done there but it's not just that production or delivery it's the impact it's then having on companies themselves so those are three key differentiators and issues apply that and you'll start finding the number of companies you're dealing with are coming down to a smaller number and then carry out your due diligence as to whether you think they're in the right business and the right growth areas you can see some which are obviously going to be really struggling and will fail, quite a lot will fail, will be the likes of the airlines um, because you know, they have a high cost base and going to be very difficult indeed. So the likes of British Airways, it was, didn't take much of a forecast to know that Willie Walsh was going to run it into the ground and take every opportunity here to cut the costs, get rid of the planes they don't want, get rid of the routes and get rid of the staff and renegotiate all of that. Now, if you're a keen supporter of that, then he's done exactly what you would expect. Um, but you know, it has had, obviously, a huge impact on not just the staffing, but also everyone related to it. Yeah. But most of those airlines, unless they are flying their government flag and the government's willing to support them, are going to find it very difficult, and well, quite a number of them won't be there. Yeah, no, absolutely. And there's 11 cruise ships parked off the, level, off the uh, south coast of England, uh, yeah. owned yeah. by Carnival, and a few others... Uh, knocking around. Now, what about uh, a forecast or two? I've just looked up the FTSE. It's at 6,032.85 10 seconds ago. What about uh, at the beginning of October? Good God, I haven't got a clue. Nobody, there was all of this. Uh, there's, uh, there's those who don't know, and those who don't know, they don't know. Um, what you will remember, actually, of course, with the greatest level of return you will get, and this is weakened considerably, I grant you, is not just the price of the shares, but the compounding of the dividends that you're getting of the shares gives you the long-term value, to which quite rightly you turn around and say, but hang on, dividends have been slashed, and the amount of dividends you're getting is now much lower than it used to be. That's true, um, but hopefully as the economy will eventually improve, 
therefore you're going to see some uh, some improvement in that uh, overall return. So I am bullish in the fact that I assume the world isn't going to come to an end, um, but it's going to be very difficult. This is going to be more difficult, I think, than most have uh, actually uh, thought so far. Some people have been very bullish. But if I see a FTSE 100 at the wrong end of 5,000 heading towards that, I'm going to be a buyer on that because there's some very good companies in it. And they're not British, they're global. The FTSE 100 is not a British index. Uh, it's a very good uh, global measure. Uh, but so very simply, that's going to be an interesting one. The question is, how do we get the bad news out now? And how much more is there to come? Do you think there's going to be a second wave or not? I think most people probably think there is. And how are those companies in a position to be able to manage that, handle their way through it? So at the moment, I'm seeing probably if it gets down to 5,000 or so maybe a little bit below that, um, that's a cracking good buying opportunity. But I could see easily this market going uh, back over seven quite easily, but I don't think that's going to be sustainable for long. Um, it's going to be in this sort of six, six and a half thousand range, I think, for some time until you can start seeing a coordinated global recovery. Um, and at the moment, with the current US leadership, we have to get that election out of the way. And you're going to have to see that how the discussion is going to go with Chinese trade uh, and European trade it's going to take, it's, going, it's a long, hard route. And Europe has been almost sidelined at the moment. And remember the fundamental flaws in their currency are still there and going to cause problems unless they're willing to actually grasp that. So I am positive on the basis that companies will adjust, they'll make money, there will be better returns. And if you're seeing some significant discounts, um, then if you just want to buy the index, buy it when it's on a cheap level, but be prepared for the fact that actually it's going to be a very bumpy ride over the next few years. The bit I find, and I always make sure I'll, every year I have a bit of cash put on one side precisely for that. I'm not going to get the bottom of the market, though, whatever it does. Um, what you can do, though, is when you've got a good asset and you see it at a discount, just take some of it. Don't try and be greedy. Just take advantage of that and be willing to sit on it. Fantastic. A couple of questions in the box, if I may ask you these. Um, Please do. I was thinking this one, and Will Kintish asked it. How did Woodford get away with it for so long if it wasn't obvious that's what was happening? And I thought the commentators or the newspapers, the quality papers, that's what they're there for, in a way. No. Oh, they, they, seriously, they didn't want to know. And I was having discussions with the likes of Ian Cowie and the others. They were saying, yeah, but look at the performance. It's been really good. Well, how many other examples do we have to go through where we've seen examples which are really very good? We had even the, the head of the uh, uh, New York Stock Exchange find itself in a position running a perfectly good fund. Actually, that was NASDAQ. Turned out, in fact, of course, it was completely false. Um, and in terms of Woodford, no one was willing to believe what was actually going on underneath it because he had such a good track record. But if, as I mentioned earlier, you look underneath at what he was investing and what influence he had over that share price, it meant that he was actually trading in mud. And so when there was going to be some difficulty, he couldn't get out of it and it was going to be difficult. Plus the fact you then found yourself paying more for the benefit of that fund. You then have companies like Hargreaves Lansdowne who promoted in their sort of tip sheet and allow you to buy it at a special, a special uh, particular subset of the shares, uh, subset of the fund rather, which has got a higher charge on it. So they recommend it and they earn more money out of it. And to me, and they're talking to the regular about, regulator about it, saying, look, that is an abuse of the system. But I'm afraid our regulators are asleep on the job. And you only have to look at this year at the appalling activity that was going on outside the old British steel factories. We had people with their pension money, their last, their only pot of cash being ripped off by not IFAs, just FAs. Um, and uh, people actually providing a bread, just nicking their money. And the regulator did nothing. They were saying, well, show me an example. It's there, there's the news. That's, you can see them there. So I'm afraid in terms of regulation, it's nice to have regulation, but I'm afraid that for a lot of us, we're gonna to have to do our own cynicism to be able to make sure we don't get caught out with these things. That is dreadful because we are paying for the regulator. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we're paying for them. We're locking up our hard-earned cash, our hard-earned pensions, and they're not doing their job. No, they're not. And, and why? Because actually, what you'll find is they don't... In America, the American regulators are much better. Why? 
because you'll find they recruit the best and they'll get really good people and they'll pay them a lot of money to be there because actually if you want someone to actually find you where the nasties are find someone who's running the nasties um and so you'll find some really good quality people whereas in this country you don't aspire to go to the regulator that's not something you necessarily important on your on your cv whereas of course it should be they should have the not just people who are from the industry but really good people in there also people who have the right attitude that there is a thing about doing the right thing behaving properly and realizing it is a privilege to look after people's money not a right and uh, i'm afraid the industry is too has too much self pride and too much ego uh, to actually uh, admit when it gets it wrong and to realize that they have to try and change i found this when i had to resign from barclays again when barclays actually for a firm that became barclays stockbroker because they managed to introduce an inactivity fee so you get charged for doing something then you get charged for doing nothing brilliant <laughs> at that um, stage i left good man we're both getting accused in the chat box of being grumpy so just <laughs> but it's, it's mike ogilvy again of course but we'll take no notice of him but um we had um, just we had uh, jeremy wilson on last week talking about cryptocurrencies and the um Belt and Road Initiative, and mm. uh, I thought the Belt and Road Initiative was somewhere in East London. It was Belt and Road East One. I had to look that up. But uh, can you say anything about cryptocurrencies? And that's your... Friday afternoon spanking in the city, isn't it? Uh, that's something Absolutely. like that. I, we'll move on from that. Uh, Belt and Road. That is a, a wonderful Chinese initiative to try and actually make sure there is more trade uh, operating with China. China has actually been moving. I remember Trump was sort of saying China should get out of low cost production. He's not paying attention. China's been getting out of low-cost production for some time, moving it to low-cost operational centers like Indonesia, Bangladesh, and Pal, um, and uh, focusing much more further up the, the chain. Because if you look at the Chinese economy now, it is not a manufacturing economy. Yes, of course, it makes a lot of stuff. The majority of its economy is now a service economy. Uh, so changed very dramatically, much more middle class in terms of its uh, development. So it's still a very big manufacturer, of course it is, but it's fundamentally changed. So what China wants to do, whether it's through infiltrating, that's probably an overly dramatic term, but making sure strategically they're invested uh, into countries by trade, you know, by the Belt and Silk Road, uh, by loans and debt, by technology, Huawei and others, and making sure, therefore, they are uh, uh, locked into areas. Now, you could say that's a spider's web, or you could say it's a good trading mechanism, depending on your point of view. The, actual, the answer is actually it's a probably a combination of both. As for cryptocurrencies, if they sound strange and difficult to understand and unreliable, that's because they are. They're not currencies. They're a form of betting. They're not, regulatory, they're not regulated at all. Of course, some have gone up. You know, Bitcoin's gone up. There are various other ones which have done very well, and they've gone down dramatically. Actually, they are a mechanism for dodgy parts of the market to actually hide their transactions. Uh, and I'm afraid I don't wish to be a part of that. I wouldn't recommend people participate in it at all. Um, if you want to actually have, get involved in currency trading, that's fine. There are lots of currencies you can try and trade. You see them go up and down, they're nice and liquid. Bitcoin, you have no control over whatsoever. It's environmentally dangerous because it costs a huge amount to run. Just the computer power alone to be able to do so. Uh, so on that basis, I see very little upside for that. Whereas I do see upside for good businesses which are adapting to the new environment, the new economy, and have the opportunity to grow. And I'm coming across a lot of those at the moment, um, but they need the help to try and adjust to the new world. As of course, day by day, we see it slowly but developing. And of course, it may easily go back again if we get this ubiquitous second wave but you can see how the good companies have already adjusted and changed. And they'll have to keep on doing so. That provides us with the opportunity. Fantastic, Justin. Uh, thank you for your time today. Will you stay on once I stop the recording and answer any other, any other yeah. questions? When yeah, I mute people. Three things before you go. Um, number one, will you come back and join us in October and tell us what you think about uh, Brexit, uh, Mr. Trump's re-election, and anything else exciting that's happened in the uh, two months uh, in between? Number two, Mr. Trump's re-election. Oh my God! 
Right, okay. Yes, of course, and I shall be happily embarrassed at the fact I got the FTSE wrong. Yeah. Um, but no, I'd be delighted okay. um, because the questions your, your group come up with are fantastic. There's no such thing as a stupid question, just many stupid answers, as you probably found out last time. <laughs> Justin Urquhart, Stuart, thanks for joining us. We wish you all well with Regionally, and we look forward to seeing you shortly.